ladies and gentlemen, it is I, Emily Sophia, here to break down for you guys the latest episode of True Detective. We are on season two, episode five, if I am not mistaken, called Other Lives. So spoiler alert before I dive into the mad thick of things, as I shall be bearing all in this review. So many things happen in this episode that I think it warrants a pretty good overview which I'm going to attempt to supply for you guys along with my reactions and analyses intertwined. So, let's dig right into this business. So we notice first and foremost that there is a bit of a time jump from the Vinci Massacre. Of course, the very first scene in the episode shows a little bit, a little bit, <laughs> I don't know why I put a little bit of a break in the middle of that word, but a little bit of the tragic aftermath of and i'm glad that they are in fact calling it a massacre because anything less would not have sufficed for what we witnessed there um but that is of course kind of framed in the context of a news report and we see that all of the characters are in very disparate places the case having closed actually the case revolving around ben casper so this puts us in a very interesting place um and we get to see a lot of fascinating changes take place for our characters and i think that my favorite aspect of this episode was the fact that our detectives got to become put on your shades true detectives <laughs> and uh yeah i found that to be a particularly exciting change of pace and i did suspect that they were going to find some way to bring closure um, to what was unfolding, but that uh, all of our characters were going to end up coming back to the case with a vengeance. In this case, they are, um, yeah, they're on the side of the state attorney who has reopened things on the down low. And so now they're all working disparate sides of the investigation that hadn't really been touched previously or had been left behind in the aftermath with the Mexican gang. So I am going to go through character by character and talk about everything that we got to witness and then include whatever other thoughts I can just to attempt to pin down the details. But I like this episode a lot. And I can tell that they are stepping up the action and the intrigue in a way that is making me very excited for the final three episodes. I hope that you guys found them to be rewarding too. So first of all, I'm going to talk about what happened with Annie. I did take some notes during this episode, so if you see me looking into the distance, it's not because I don't love you and want to hold your wonderful gaze, but because I'm trying to keep track of all the details and be a true detective. <laughs> I promise this will probably be the second or third to last time that I use the uh, title of the show to describe something that happened in the show. Now anyways, so we get to see Annie of course opening up about her sexual preferences in the context of a therapy group for people who have gone through different sexual harassment cases. <laughs> So she ends up elaborating on the merit of girth, in fact, which evokes a rather interesting response from her support group members, all of whom are men, <laughs> which just makes for a fascinating environment. And I just love the way that Rachel McAdams sort of portrayed this almost like resigned but mischievous and fierce look on Annie's face as she is sort of taking these these guys on and just being like hey yo this is what i like whether or not she's being facetious or genuine and in fact potentially shedding light on the sexual encounter in which we first encountered her when we met her i don't know but yeah this was the inevitable outcome of course of the case that was made against her in the previous episode so she is working through that and unfortunately is as a result stuck in evidence um but yeah so we see later that annie is actually still investigating the case of the missing girl from back in the first episode too um so even though she's trapped in the sinkhole of evidence at the precinct she manages to get some help from her former partner um and he makes it clear that she might have avoided this fate if she had more friends in the precinct 
since somebody was clearly targeting her for takedown and she didn't really have anybody who could come alongside her and support her and get her out of the worst of the line of fire. Um, but yeah, so she's able to get a little bit of assistance in her pursuit. And this actually later leads her to um, meeting up with the um, state attorney and Ray and Paul. And of course, what ensues there is the hush hush reopening of the Ben Casper case with the new information, with everybody kind of having their new goals. Um, Ray, of course, is the only one who's really resistant to partaking in the reopening of the case, but everybody's roles are pretty clearly underscored and there is some kind of outcome that is in everybody's favor. Yeah, Ray is the only one who really seems to be kind of turned off to the idea of getting back into this, but they all kind of end up conceding based on their own different reasons. Um, and then, of course, she meets up with her sister, hoping to find a way to get an invitation to one of the hooker parties in an attempt to gain further information, but in that process also discovers that her sister is attempting to turn her life around and, you know, go, fr go fresh and um, get into her studies at Cal Arts, and this is a great development in Annie's relationship with her sister and in her sister's life, so that's exciting stuff. Oh, and also, you, you will notice um, a very distinct difference with the character of Annie is that she is no longer a smoker of e-cigs, but has graduated to full-on cigarettes, so... She's kind of cutting out the the semblance of stress relief, and you know, she even tells Ray that she's been drinking more as it is, and just kind of goes for it. Um, also, of course, she, before the meeting with her and Paul and the state attorney, uh, she and Ray meet up at the old bar to discuss the missing girl and the fact that it's just as Nova. And we get a lot of the quotes that were in the trailers for this season in this episode. What with Annie talking about how this girl's missing and nobody cares and billions of dollars have come out of this and now what? Is there, is there any justice to be had in this world? Even though neither of them are doing detective work, technically they are the true detectives. <laughs> Maybe this will be the second to last time I use that no promises um but yeah so n but nobody's commenting on the fact that she is done with the e-cigs and smoking cigarettes because quite frankly nobody's happy <laughs> nobody's really getting what they want out of life and they're all struggling through in their own ways of course going back into this case may very well put some of them on the up and up in a way they haven't been before if you can call it that because it's like going from total misery and despair to like maybe a greater sense of purpose is <laughs> that's that's an ascension of some sort right so ultimately she and paul go and investigate some of the properties that she got a hold of through her partner only to discover the torture hut in the woods so this is the can of worms that i have been waiting for and now i think we are going to be exploring the ben casper case from uh, more angles than I think we ever have and it's gonna heat up pretty dang quickly So that's kind of the broad scope of what's going on with Annie that leads us on to Paul Who accompanied by the state attorney meets with the celebrities lawyers from way back in the day? Um, he's evidently working off the streets now not doing what he wants to and feels like he was meant to do but he continues to adamantly insist that he was never where the actress said that he was. Now later, he goes to visit the mother in her nursing home. Or not nursing home, <laughs> motor home. <laughs> that would be a very upsetting place to full on retire. But um, yeah, so he tells her that he's going to get married to his fiance, Emily, who's not me and that's okay. Um, but yeah, she's several months pregnant. All of this appears to be news to the mother. Now, when he goes to look for the $25,000 that he brought back from his time in Afghanistan, he figures out that um, his mother 
Cynthia figured that the money was supposed to be a gift to her, who, of course, sacrificed her career as a dancer to bring Paul into the world and to carry him, as she states several times. Um, but yeah, it, it seems like she's disgusted by Paul's attempt to not only live the life that she never got to, of course, her being a single mother, a, a disadvantaged, uh, marginalized woman, but, you know, also getting to be married and to raise a child alongside somebody else. Um, so not only is he doing this, but he's walking away from the life that he probably truly wants, maybe with another man, um, in order to keep up a facade that Cynthia might have killed for, you know. Um, but yeah, so the complexities in their relationship really come forward in this episode, not to mention Taylor Kitsch's ability to flex his rage muscles, which he's been really good at for this character. So I applaud him for that. Um, but yeah, so his, meanwhile, his little play pretend marriage with Emily appears to be heading in a good direction, and Emily's, uh, mother, his future mother-in-law, seems to be pretty cool. And that's all going fine and dandy, but there is definitely a tension that pervades even that nice little family dinner that they're having there. Um, so yeah. Later on, of course, we get to the point where Paul meets up with the other true d detectives and reveals that, yeah, he wants to get in on this. He's not happy with where he has been placed and he is still still um, insisting that he did not do what he did with the celebrity and continues to complicate his career. So this is a chance for him to continue continue to do something that is of worth and, you know, take his mind off of the domestic, relational, sexual identity struggles that are going on on the home front. And yeah, so he investigates Casper's uh, jewels, although he finds out that Dixon already beat him to the punch, and then joins, uh, joins Annie on a trip through the woods to find the torture hut of unpleasantness. So, whew, that is what's happening with Paul. Like I said, I think that getting to see the dynamic with his mother was was really interesting and in seeing all the different shades of their relationship and where exactly the source of their tension comes from. Um, why it is that Cynthia is so outraged towards Paul for doing what he's doing. It just it is very multivalent and works in a lot of different directions. So I'm, I'm glad that we kind of got to explore that and that side of him a little bit more. And it makes sense that he would want to be a part of the rekindled Casper case um, because it's it's something that makes sense to him. In the midst, the midst of so much that doesn't make sense, finally he gets to do something that's like, yeah, I understand this, I get this, I'm going to go for it. Now, this brings us to Frank, and of course Ray is going to be saved for last. So we catch Frank at the very beginning of the episode. He's watching some news coverage about the aftermath of the Vinci murder, which has led to the quote unquote closure of the case with the Mexican gangs. And it's bolstered apparently the political campaign of the attorney general, Vince Masuka from Dexter, <laughs> who's now running for governor. And then he also hears that they're gonna be breaking ground for a new rail line development and yada, yada, yada. Um, so then later at one of his bars, he's confronted by a potential partner who he ends up quickly dismissing and then later goes on to have a little chatty chat with the mayor and talk about the poker room where certain people are now being moved as part of his latest operations. Um, so while at one of his new joints, since Santos has been way out of the picture since he lost some teeth, I'm assuming he's probably going in for some good old dental work taking a nice vacation but he ends up having a bit of a breakdown with his wife Jordan um, who has found out of course about the prostitution that's going on in Frank's poker room um, and she's adamant that she not merely becomes some sleazy gangster's wife which Frank attempts to shoot down he's like oh I don't like that you know I'm not a gangster like this is just the way that things have to be and I think that that makes a lot of sense I I don't see Frank personally as a gangster of, of any sort. He's a man who is 
kind of like he describes, making do to what level of success remains yet to be seen. I anticipate a possibly tragic ending for him, but I don't know, man, a lot can change. And then also she reveals that she cannot have the child that Frank so desperately wanted to have before he started dipping back into the drug moving scene and the clubs and the girls and all that stuff. Um, so she comes clean about her medical appointments, all of which seem to point to infertility, but in the same vein, she pushes even further for going for adoption with them. And she believes that Frank so fiercely opposed the idea in the first place um, because of the fear of seeing himself in that adopted child and having to come to terms with his ugly past by confronting this kid who, you know, maybe has endured some of the hardships or types of hardships that he did. And he wants to be so wholly past that and to establish a new legacy with a child that is like all his own. But it's quickly becoming clear that if that's something that Frank and Jordan truly want, they're going to have to pursue alternative means. Just as Frank has been trying to pursue alternative means of finances and success and ways to build his empire in light of the five million dollars that were lost in the midst of Casper's death. Um, but yeah, so ultimately the two-way question that Jordan ends up posing is who loves whom? And Frank ends up giving her an out before she even goes into the stuff about her infertility. Um, and Jordan could definitely take that out. He's like, yeah, you know, this kind of sucks, but it's the way it is and yada, yada, yada. But she would rather that they reclaim their intimacy and love with each other and just endure and press on instead of being torn apart by circumstance. I think the idea here is that sometimes you have to go back to go forward. That seems to be what's happening with the case with with Casper and just a, a lot of the stuff in our characters personal lives so um it looks like Jordan and Frank decide to try to rekindle their love um and then Frank at the same time goes in for land once more with a waste removal service offer thing at which point he's told about Casper's film collection, AKA the missing hard drive at the not so fun house. Um, and if he can recover this, then apparently he's gonna get five parcels of land from the corridor. And there is a hair in my eyeball that I am now not so surgically removing. Anyway, so all in all, it actually seems to be going pretty swimmingly for Frank for the first time in a good long time. You know, he's relocating from his other place with his wife and now they've got a ceiling over their heads that doesn't have a spot and the future's so bright and they could get a farm and grow crops and, you know, some dreams weren't built to last as is evidenced by the knocking upon his door. And of course, we all know who that is, a non-mustachioed and very, very angry Ray Velcoro. Which leads me to talking about him and his life shenanigans, so bear with me, we're almost done with the information dump. But yeah, so at the beginning, he is revisited by his boss, who tells him that the Ben Casper case has been closed. And it's pretty apparent that Ray has since moved on to a new form of life and profession, judging by the absence of the legendary forest that once graced his upper lip. I'm talking about that missing stash. I was feeling the absence, like no e-cigarettes, no mustache. Clearly we are in an unprecedented era in the show. But yeah, so it turns out that he's working as Frank for Muscle. Um, and he's also kicked out of his house because he's no longer working for the municipality of Vinci. Or at least he's not kicked out right away, but he has to be out within the next couple months or whatever. Um, so after he puts in a little bit of work for Frank, he goes to court um, to further pursue the maintenance of his uh, custody with Chad. Only to discover that the, the ex-wife is efficiently efficiently officially <laughs> pushing for the big the big p the paternity test <laughs> and he now has to have supervised visitation with his son which is just a huge blow on every account and 
it appears that he's definitely going to need some more cash from the Frankster in the midst of this really harrowing process for him. Um, so he's able to get an extra job from Frank, of course, and while recording what I think is a voice memo for his son about how, like, you know, pain is inexhaustible, but, like, only, only people are exhaustible, whatever the quote is. Um, but at the same time, he's able to spy on the creepy therapist who is moving girls along with Frank's guy. And then, of course, later on, um... He meets up with Annie again. The two of them kind of catch up and exchange whatever details about where their lives have come, what Annie is still doing, and she's sort of, you know, trying trying to get his head back into the game in which they were previously, but from a brand new angle. So this is comes to the point where he meets with the state attorney and Paul and Annie, um, and the state attorney in this process reveals in the big jaw-dropping moment of the episode that um, the real rapist was actually caught not long ago and has the same DNA as that of his son. <laughs> so we went there. We went there. This episode delivered quite a big twist. Now... At, at this point, uh, the state attorney says that she will offer him every ounce of support that she can to ensure his son's safety if he can get some valuable information about the case. This is the point at which he goes and lays the hurt down on the creepy doctor and, you know, discovers some interesting details about the Chassani family and the men of affluence, the parties, and apparently some blackmailing stuff. So a lot of interesting things come forward as uh, teeth are spit out onto the floor. <laughs> Another recurring kind of motif of the show is losing teeth. It's like that classic nightmare where you're spitting your teeth out. <laughs> but yeah, so this provides a pretty good opportunity for Ray uh, to get his head back into the game and to release some of his newfound rage over the realization of the fact that he not only murdered the wrong guy, but that is exactly what cost his relationship with his wife. So he was in no way able to enact the justice that he thought he did, which was probably one of the few things that was keeping him going, even knowing the fact that this pushed his wife away that he was still able to get some kind of justice for what happened to her, but then in fact it was all wrong and everything sucks. And he talks with his ex-wife about it, who asks, well, fills in the blank and says, why would you lie about that? And he's like, well, I don't know. <laughs> but I, judging by his various reactions, I'm thinking that he did not lie and he made good on the guy that Frank gave him in the flashback way from early on. So, you know, basically he is screwed over in every possible way, knowing that the kid isn't his and he killed the wrong guy. All he has left at this point is to pursue the Casper case with a fresh sense of urgency and to have a little chat with his employer. So, I'm, oh man, this has already been a long review. I think I was able to kind of box in some of my thoughts and reactions, but... I'm feeling much better about the direction of things now as of this episode, and that is good because we've got three left, three chapters in which to move heaven and earth. I think it can be done. I think that the, the stakes are high, personally, for just about everybody, especially, of course, in this moment, uh, Paul and, uh, or, well, not Paul, sorry, Ray and Frank. Paul and Annie are in their own kind of sticky situation, but yeah, in general, it's like the show has kind of rebooted itself, and we are back into the game in a way that we have not been before, mostly because of the way that um, things went down with Vinci and the state and like the corruption investigation, and now everybody's sort of reaping the spoils on the outside, but there is a much darker heart of this thing that is going to be discovered, so... Yeah, that's the gist of it. That is the crumbling of the cookie of the true detective. So thank you guys so much for watching my review. And as always, oh yes, by the way, watch my new Hannibal review, especially if you have been watching the show and even if you've just seen the movie Hannibal because 
interesting stuff happened in the show this week. But yeah, so as always, I shall be back before you know it.